Hi, everybody. My name is Linda Abraham, and I am the president of Accepted and the moderator for today's webinar. I want to welcome all of you to Get Accepted to Medical School in 2022. This webinar will be presented by Alicia McNeese Namankar. Before we start, a few items of note. Alicia may ask you some questions during the pre presentation and also ask you to raise your hand in response. You can do so by clicking on the hand icon, as I'm sure you all realize, at the bottom of your control panel. Please raise your hand when you find it. I kind of feel when I do this like I'm the, steward, the, the flight attendant explaining how to buckle your seatbelt. But anyways, let's go through this little exercise. Okay, all right, enough of you know how to do this, so we can move on. Now, raising hands is one way for you to respond to our questions. What about your questions? We have a lot of time during at the end of Alicia's presentation for questions, and we'll answer them then. A few more points. We're going to use the question window for your questions. To answer our questions, if they're open-ended, please post your responses in the chat window. It's much easier to quickly go through the questions during a Q&A if they're all in the question window. When you leave, you'll receive a brief survey. Please, please fill it out. We value your feedback. We're going to announce a special discount today for webinar registrants, but rather than have you anxiously waiting to find out what it is and at the end of the webinar, I'm going to reduce your anxiety levels and announce it now. Save $250 on a primary application package, $500 on a primary plus secondary application package, and you have one week only to sign up for this fantastic discount. The coupon code is save now and it ends December 17th. I also want to mention that we just recently got a firm on the site. So there are now payment options ranging from three months to six months, 12 months, 36 months um, on the site through a firm. And that some people might find that very appealing. Finally, I'm thrilled to introduce Alicia McNeese Namankar, who will present Get Accepted to Medical School in 2022 today. Alicia started advising Accepted's clients in 2012. She immediately was earning rave reviews from her clients. Prior to joining Accepted, she both evaluated applications and advised med school applicants as director of the UC Davis post -Bac program. She brings enormous insight and experience with the medical school application process to our webinar today. Without further ado, Alicia McNeese Namankar and Get Accepted to Medical School 2022. Thank you for joining us, everyone. I'd like to start by asking how many people have applied to medical school? So you can give us a show of hands. About 10%. Okay, great. And one more question for those of you who have applied, that 10%. What part of the application process did you have the most difficulty completing? In the chat window, please. So AMCAS application, letters of recommendation, secondary applications, or interviews. Do you want to allow the 90% the that haven't already applied to say what's most concerning them? Sure. Okay, so those of you who have not yet applied can also answer the question. All right, so we have a secondaries here from India. Anybody else, what's concerning you the most or did you find most difficult? Catherine, haven't applied yet, most scared about essays. Stacy, primary application. Okay, let's, let's move on, okay? So the good news is we're gonna cover all of those topics and more. So today we're gonna to give you a, an overall big picture perspective of the entire application process. And we're gonna focus primarily on the AMCAS application for MD schools. So after you take the MCAT, the first stop on your journey to medical school is the primary application. The AMCAS application can be submitted as early as June 1st or as late um, as early November. However, the sooner the better. You don't want to wait until November to submit. The application itself contains a personal statement, which is 5,300 characters, a statement of disadvantage, if that applies to you, and that's 1,325 characters, and we'll discuss that more in detail later. 15 activity descriptions, and you want to use all 15 and that's 700 characters each, so a very small paragraph. 
and three most meaningful essays, and that's 1,325 characters. The best strategy for every part of the application process is really to submit your best work. You want to submit essays that you're proud of. So school selection. How do you decide which schools to apply to? So for reapplicants, how many schools did you guys apply to last time you applied? In the chat window, please. Again, should we open it up to say how many people, how many do they plan to apply to since? Sure, okay. sure. Yeah. Six, 25 from Shalene, six was from India, 20 to 30 from Chow. I apologize if I mispronounce somebody's name, 25 from Kathleen, 20, 10 to 20 from Maria. Yeah, these are good numbers. So. The six I'd be worried about that might be too few, that might look overconfident. And you want to maximize your chance, right, at acceptance by applying to a, a good number. Um, so I think I would say six is too few, but anywhere from 20 to 25 or more if you have the energy um, would be even better. If applicable, you can apply for the fee assistance program on the AAMC website. If you are eligible for it, you get a reduced fee for the MCAT exam. You get to apply to 20 schools, and the application fee is waived. And the secondary application fees will also be waived for those schools. So to, to, to select schools, you want to evaluate your staff and compare to medical schools you would like to attend using the MSAR. Now is the time to attend virtual pre-med conferences to network with other students, medical students, and medical school outreach officers. If you can, visit medical school campuses virtually. More and more schools have virtual tours available. And now is a good time to start looking at schools thinking about which programs you want to apply to. Research schools that specialize in your research interests or fields of interest. And are there any questions so far? If you'd like to ask a question, please put it in the question window. Any questions on school selection? Or just kind of the high overview that Alicia has given? How do medical schools view an unbalanced MCAT score? I scored a 519, but a 126 in CARS. This is from an anonymous attendee. Yeah, that's an outstanding overall score. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really outstanding score. Um, it depends. So it depends on what schools you're planning on applying to or if you have the energy to retake it. But, I mean, overall, that's a fantastic score. Wouldn't it I think it'd be a little bit on the rest of the profile? Yeah. I, don't, I mean, of course, the activities matter. The GPA matters. Um, but overall, I mean, I think that's a very strong score. What do you think, Linda? It's a very strong score. I, I, I would hate to have this person uh, take, take it again. So if there's evidence of strong verbal skills in other ways, maybe, yeah. you know, took a lot of English classes or, or whatever, then, um, you know, writing skills, communications ability, then I would probably be less inclined to, um, to recommend a retake. On the other hand, the car score if multiplied times four works out to a 504. So it, it really is a, a low score. Um, it also depends on, like I said, you know, your grades overall, the schools you're aiming for, as Alicia said. So it's something where we probably need to look at the rest of your application to really make a recommendation. Do you agree, Alicia? Yeah, I do, I do. Um, I would just hate for that person to retake it and get a lower score. Yeah, I, I you know, would too. It's so I, would really, I would really like to avoid that. Yeah, and I mean, that happens. I, I see it happen all the time. Um, so I think you're right. If you can demonstrate strong um, writing skills or communication skills in other areas, um, I would say apply with it. That's such a fantastic score. Congratulations. Okay, so... Somebody, I don't know if it's the same anonymous attendee or a different anonymous attendee, but this person is asking, how do you compare stats? 
I'm not quite sure what you mean. Do you mean compare your stats to the schools? Um, yeah, so using the MSAR, so the Medical School Admissions um, Rate Requirement Handbook, you would purchase access to it electronically on the AAMC website, and it gives you a breakdown of each school's stats, right? So it tells you what's the average MCAT, um, uh, overall MCAT, as well as a breakdown of the different scores. And that for that person, that would be the best approach, you know, to look at the average sections um, on the MCAT to see, like, which schools you would be most competitive at. Um, right? You can also look at the average GPAs accepted, as well as the high, the lows, um, but you want to compare your numbers to the schools, but keep in mind, um, right, those numbers um, can seem intimidating. So as long as one of your scores fits within the school's range, um, that's a good place to apply. So if your MCAT score, for example, fits within their average, but maybe your GPA is just below it, you know, that'd be a good school for you to apply to. Okay. And I also got to ask, what did I mean when I said I multiplied it out by four for the CAR score? The, the MCAT is made up of four parts. And I wanted to see if I just took your 126, the lowest part of your, of your MCAT, and multiplied it by four, what would the total score have been just to get a, a better context of it? I, I mean, I know that 126 is not a fantastic score. But um, that's, that's all I was doing. OK. All right, Alicia, you're on. Okay, so letters of recommendation. Um, so why is this part of the application so stressful? So, so for those of you listening, and especially for our reapplicants, why is this part of the application so stressful? Okay, again, in the chat window, why is it stressful? Letters of recommendation. We don't know whom to ask, exactly. Very good, Emily. Thank you. You do not know what is being written about you. Good. That's from Matthew. You never know what the other person may write. That's from India. You also don't know when they're going to write it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I agree with all of these. Um, it takes time and patience. Um, and a lot of it is out of your control, right? So that can be um, very frustrating. I would say it's most important for you to know that this, the letters of recommendation are actually due with the secondary application. However, it's a good idea to begin requesting them early, so give your letter writers a deadline of the date that you plan to submit the primary so that you have them ready as soon as you want to submit your secondary. So plan to have those letters before or during the time you, you are going to submit your primary application. So how do you successfully approach the process of requesting letters of recommendation? Number one, only ask professors from whom you received A's. They're going to have to rank you in these letters, so you don't want to ask somebody who's given you a B, and especially not a C. Um, no matter how much they like you, if you got a B in the course, they're still going to have to rank you based on that grade. Ask the people who know you best. So this is a great reason to participate in your virtual office hours, right, and weekly if you can. I would schedule it in like it's a lecture so that you make sure you participate every week. It's a good idea to have backup letters. Never rely on one person alone for a letter of recommendation. So plan to have, and you might want to write this down, it's a good plan to have two to three science professor letters. Most medical schools ask for at least two science professor letters, so having two or three ready um, is a good idea. One to two community service letters. One to two clinical experience letters. One leadership letter. And one research letter, if applicable, or a letter from an employer or non-science professor. So a lot of med schools ask for one letter from a non-science professor, so it's a good idea to have that in your back pocket. So for those of you listening, whom will you ask for letters of recommendation? In the chat window, please. Okay. 
and where you find credit, ask for letters of recommendation. We have some latency here. Anybody want to share? You're going to ask professors or research directors. So definitely not, right? Family, friends, <laughs> right? So we are getting some answers yeah. here. And, okay, good. Um, so let's see, science professors and community service supervisors. Um, yeah. One wrote, I'm a non-traditional applicant and have already attended grad school. So I originally had nine LORs. Is this too many? That's an interesting question. Um, I've asked three science course professors and one global health professor so far. Okay. Um, Chow wrote a professor who taught me and I'm a mentor for his class. India wrote supervisor from work study, ophthalmologist, I shadow teachers. And Matthew's asking if you could just repeat that count of letters that you gave. Yeah, of course, of course. Or I can actually um, put it in the, in the chat window. Yeah, so two to three science professor letters, one to two community service letters, one to two clinical experience letters, one leadership letter, and one research letter if applicable, or a letter from an employer or non-science professor. And according to the AAMC letter service, you can have um, up to 10 letters of rec. So nine is not too many. However, um, while 10 is the limit for the AAMC letter service, each school has a different limit. So some schools will only accept three letters, some schools five, some schools seven. So um, the schools vary um, on what their, re their requirements are for the letters. Okay. Um, I think we can so move moving on. on. Yeah. yeah, let's move on. Okay, so to help your letter writers do their absolute best, you want to provide them with a deadline, right? Definitely a deadline, and a letter packet when you request a letter. So it's a good idea to give them a final draft of your personal statement an updated copy of your resume or CV, a cover letter that's generated by the AMC letter service or Interfolio, right? It'll have a barcode and link to your account and any other materials that they request. So maybe a transcript, for example. If possible, it's always best to request letters in person, but under the circumstances, um, doing it, you know, over Zoom or um, you know, during office hours or sending an email um, would also work. All right, secondary applications. So I would say, in my opinion, in 14 years of um, working with students on applications, I would say the secondary applications are the hardest part. What do you think, Linda? They're pretty stressful. It's so stressful. So I think a lot of people underestimate how many secondaries they're going to get. Um, and I have some people get 17 secondaries within a you know, five-day period, right? When they come in, they can all come in at once. And people get pretty stressed out about it, right? Because you have a lot of essays within each secondary to return. So don't underestimate this part of the application process. Um, so they can arrive immediately after you submit the application or takes weeks to arrive, depending on whether the schools send out automatic secondaries or pre-screen before sending them out. Often students are overwhelmed, right, by the number of secondaries that they receive. And each secondary can contain anywhere from one long essay to 12 short essays. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> Examples of common unsuccessful strategies that I've seen include saving them all to do them together, waiting longer than two weeks to submit them, submitting rough drafts without editing, not prioritizing them by deadline or order of importance, cutting and pasting without changing the name of the school, right, which can lead to an automatic rejection. You don't want to do that. And then not having letters of recommendation to submit by the deadline or the right combination of letters of rec. It's a time-consuming task, 
So break it down into sections, right? Complete one secondary at a time. Often it's helpful to work with a professional editor like me and my colleagues to receive feedback on your work before you submit it to make sure you do your absolute best. After you complete the first batch of secondaries, many of the questions become repetitive and you can adapt and recycle responses. But this does not mean copy pasting. It means changing the essay to meet the prompt in the school. If possible, you want to include any new activities, awards, or accomplishments. And are there any questions about secondaries? Okay, we have questions coming in. So Matthew asks, our, this is an interesting question, very good question. Are secondaries less more equivalent to primaries in their impact on admissions considerations in your experience? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, isn't it? Um, yeah, well, the fact that it depends on whether it's automatic or manual. If it takes weeks and weeks to get that secondary, then it means that the school has actually screened your application, so it's a bigger complement if, um, if it takes longer to get it. So it means it's, it's manual. I would say it's equivalent because, right, to, get to, to submit the primary and to get their attention in order to get a secondary means you did something right, right? So... Um, and to make sure you return that secondary within two weeks is the absolute best possible thing you could do. Um, but it's possible to make mistakes in the primary that don't lead to a secondary. It's also possible to make mistakes in the secondary that don't lead to an interview. So I would say it's equivalent. What do you think, Linda? I think the question is academic. It's an interesting question. You know, we can, you can debate it, but I think it's, it's purely academic because basically you have to get both of them right. Yeah, yeah, you get that's so, a good way to Matthew, put it. Matthew, thank you for the very thoughtful question. Yeah, um, it's uh, I think it's a distinction without a difference, they have to both be good. Yes, yeah, I agree. Right. Equivalent, yeah, but it you know, it's nice to toss around and think about a little bit. Okay, let's yeah, some other, other questions here. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee What does the secondary application ask for? Oh, all kinds of questions. In fact, we have a webinar just about secondaries. That's right. And in that, we actually break down the three main structures, the three main types of questions that you get in secondaries. Um, so we cover that in a lot more detail on the secondary webinar, which um, I would highly recommend. Okay. And then the last secondary question, and there's some other questions about letters of rec, but we'll get, go back to them at the end. Um, what is the earliest we can receive secondaries? Um, so last cycle, I mean, this year is very different um, than ever before, but last cycle, students were getting secondaries as soon as their applications were processed. So almost immediately once the application is processed. Okay. This year's been a bit different. This year, they've come in a lot later. Right. But um, yeah, I don't know how that'll change uh, next cycle. Right. All right. There are a couple more secondary questions here, actually. And um there is something I want to write about on my personal statement, but is more applicable to secondary essays. By doing this, I found that my PS became generic. Is this a problem? Um, I don't have enough information, I think, to provide a strong response. What do you think, Linda? Um, I mean, it's never a good idea to have a generic personal statement. Exactly. And I would say um, the one thing I'm most proud of is in my work with my clients, none of their personal statements could ever sound like anybody else's because they're so unique and it captures their personality as well as explains, you know, their motivations for going into medicine. So no personal statement should ever sound like anybody else's. Right. 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 And if you're, if you're, I, I think you've identified the problem and almost answered your own question within your question. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. And um, yeah. last, last secondary question, then we are going to move on. And if we miss some, we'll hopefully have time to come back to it. What are your recommendations for pre-research writing secondaries? Yeah, so I have clients right now who are preparing their applications for next year. And um, usually we are finishing their primaries by winter break. And then we're working on the secondary applications in the new year. So that before the application even opens in May, they've already got everything in their primary and a good portion of their top choice school
schools, um, the secondaries done. So that way, um, you know, they, before the application even opens, they've got every part of the application process ready to go. Um, we used last, you know, the previous cycle's questions. Um, so it is a bit of a risk, you know, some schools change their secondaries. In my experience, very few schools do change them. This year, a lot of schools added a question about racism and a question about um, COVID-19. So um, you can pretty much um, predict from year to year what the questions are going to look like. Um, and students are able to recycle most of the essays. Once you've written enough secondaries, right, you're eventually going to have answered um, almost every type of question you would get. So having those ready to go, right, doing your best um, before the application even opens, right, really sets you up for success. And I have my high success rates with students who start early. Great. Yeah. So should we move on? Yeah. Okay. Interviews. And we'll go back to questions at the end. Um, so interviews. If you have successfully completed all other parts of the application, hopefully, right, you will be invited to interview anywhere from four weeks after submitting your application, or after submitting your secondary and on. Um, so there are three main types of interviews. And this has changed this year, so definitely pay attention to this part. There's, of course, the traditional style interview, which this year is virtual um, for absolutely most of the schools. Have you had anybody with an in-person, Linda? I haven't yet. No. Yeah, they're all virtual this year. Mm -hmm. um, the MMI, so multiple mini interviews. So these are, you know, um, short stations. Um, Virginia Tech actually is doing an MMI um, this year. So there are very, very few schools doing them because it's going to be harder to set up virtually, but a few of them are. And the new version, this is important, um, the VITA is it has been introduced this cycle on a pilot basis. Um, and there's not too many schools participating um, this cycle. Um, but it's six pre-recorded responses. So it's just you in front of a camera. You get two minutes to read the question, think about it. And then I think it's five minutes to record each response. Um, and then you will submit that to the schools. Um, but it's no interaction, no follow-up questions, just you um, being recorded answering six questions. Um, I would say for interviews, it's essential to prepare with mocks, right, for all formats, especially the VITA. Because you don't get to re-record any answers, right? It's one time, one shot. Um, you don't, if you don't like the response or if you don't like how it went, you don't get to record it a second time. It's just that one chance. Um, so you want to practice um, and prepare for that interview especially. You want to dress professionally, so test your outfit before the interview date. You want to bring or offer an updated copy of your CV or resume. And you can hear back after an interview anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks or longer, um, depending on the admissions process at the individual schools. Okay, so looking at the overall timeline, applying early is critical. Errors can occur or unexpected events can delay processing, like the pandemic this cycle. Uh, medical schools can run out of spots for interviews and acceptances, um, so applying early can help you, um, make, you know, make sure you get one of those spots. After you submit your primary, you can begin receiving secondary applications immediately, um, but will receive the most within four to six weeks. After submitting secondary applications, you can hear back for interviews anywhere from eight weeks or longer. And after your interview, you may hear back within two weeks to eight weeks or longer. So for those of you listening, what concept, insight, or piece of advice did you find most useful in this presentation today? So far. We still have to get the Q&A. Yeah, so far. <laughs> yeah. In the chat window, please. Okay. You're explaining the process. Applying early is key. So far, the advice about what not to do with secondary applications has been the most helpful, in my opinion. The LOR from Matthew, the, this is from Matthew, the LOR recommendations were helpful. 
Ka uh, Kathleen wrote, I didn't know what Vita was. So, okay. Great. Thank you so much for this feedback. Yeah, so I want to thank you all for your time and attention and participation. Um, and I'll take any remaining questions in just a moment. Okay. Well, I'm going to speak for a minute here. Okay. Alicia, I'm going to first of all, thank you so much for this very informative webinar. I'm sure everyone here now has fantastic insight into the entire med school application process, obviously an overview. And we're going to take additional questions in just a minute. But now I'd like to take a minute or two to share a few thoughts about the arduous process that is called medical school application. It's plain old hard to get accepted to medical school. And as many of you know, applications this cycle are up depending upon the school, 17%, 20%, I've heard different numbers, but a significant amount. Whereas in previous years, you were looking at, you know, 3% increases, a little down, a little up, nothing major. The competition, even for people who have a competitive GPA and MCAT and who volunteered and done research, it's intense. Top medical schools have acceptance rates of under 10%. And not all of you have great stats and experience, et cetera. So furthermore, in October, and as I just mentioned, AMC reported that applicant numbers were up 17%. That's where I got the figure. Over this time last year, and several schools are reporting large increases in application volume. I haven't seen the final numbers, obviously, for this application cycle, because some schools haven't even uh, closed their applications yet. But there's no question that the competition is tough and getting tougher. Let's face it, this process is long, complex, and different from college applications, which you've definitely are familiar with, you've gotten to college. It's different from anything you've done before unless you're a reapplicant, in which case something didn't work last time around. Now, Alicia has given you an outstanding overview of the process, but you still need to apply her advice to your specific situation. And we'd love to help you do so on an individual basis, one-on-one. -on -one. We here at Accepted have helped medical school applicants just like you navigate this process successfully for 26 years. Our clients are applicants like you, but they access the experience of former admissions committee members and directors, former post back program directors like Alicia, and exceptionally experienced consultants to guide them along the path to medical school acceptance. You can have that guidance too. Have a mentor to assess your school choices, advise, advise you and edit your personal statements and most meaningful experience essays, and help you again with secondaries and interview prep, the mocks that uh, Alicia was talking about. So here's what I recommend. H here are the advantages of working with an accepted consultant. You can access professional expert advice, save time, apply with confidence, and apply it successfully. And here's what I recommend you do. Visit www.accepted.com slash primary. Choose the service that's right for you get the guidance you need for that missing how, that that one-on-one -on -one application of Alicia's excellent advice to your specific situation and go from confusion to clarity and from doubts to confidence. Now, some of you may say, isn't expected accepted expensive? Well, so is rejection, but you just don't put a price tag on it quite as clearly. Our fees are clear, but the cost of rejection is not quite as obvious, even though it can be significantly higher. So let's take a look at the risks of not applying with accepted. The cost of reapplication can easily be a few thousand dollars because each application, primary plus secondary, is roughly $150 per application. There's the potential that you could that you'll need to retake the MCAT with attendant financial time and emotional cost and investment. And then there's the fact that if you get rejected, you're going to have one year less and one year later, I might add of your MD or DO earnings, right? So that's the, the biggest cost of rejection, actually. And there's a potential that you could have gotten into a better program with greater lifetime opportunities and even earnings, however you define better in this case. Every year, we work with applicants who talk to us a year earlier and decided after taking the do-it-yourself approach and getting rejected that they wanted to work with us. Now, we're happy to work with them. We are we love working with reapplicants. We love working with first-time applicants. but they would have been better off working with us initially, and so would you. Uh, last year, my daughter went to, to lunch at somebody's house, and, and there was a, actually a client there, not 
not through work. It just happened to be, it came out in the course of conversation that another guest at this particular lunch had, had been our client. And this client said that he thought his, his uh, investment in Accepted was the best investment he'd ever made because he got into PA programs a year earlier than he believes he otherwise would have. So he was making a PA salary a year earlier and that, you know, that uh, ROI for him was, uh, again, probably the highest he'll ever make. But enough from me. What do accepted clients say? Let's see. And this is for Alicia. I do apologize for lagging my response. It's evidence that I am a very, very busy because I'm a med student. I was offered four interviews total and was accepted to two schools. I chose to attend the University UCFCOM, you know, the College of Medicine in Orlando. And the next one, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, my experience working with Alicia was amazing. She was knowledgeable and guided me through all steps of the process. The turnaround time for editing my secondaries was very short and allowed me to really push ahead and having my applications out earlier. The interview prep was important because it opened my eyes to the types of questions that could be asked and really prepared me to respond to those questions in a way that would demonstrate my best qualities. I would highly recommend Alicia for the application process. Now, Alicia is currently available, and she is a wonderful advisor, mentor, and wordsmith, but she does get busy. So you can see from the other feedback on the slide now that she is one of several outstanding consultants whom we have on staff. Um, I'm going to, again, let you just look at those on your own and move on. We'd love to help you as we help these clients, the ones who wrote the comments you just saw and thousands of other clients over the last 20 years. So once again, this is what I recommend you do as a follow-up to today's webinar. Visit accepted.com slash primary, choose the service that's right for you, get the guidance you need, and apply confidently and effectively. I also want to remind you that um, there is a special now for, reg for webinar registrants and attendees. $250 off the primary application package and $500 off our primary plus secondary application package, which covers uh, the primary, many secondaries, and, and um, provides a mock interview as well as waitlist assistance. And it's, it's really pretty comprehensive. Now that we've given you an overview of the med school application process and how it can help you individually, Alicia and I are available to answer your questions on either applying to medical school or how can we can work with you individually. So there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A window. Um, and if you want to add to them, please feel free. Okay, so here we have, what general advice would you recommend for someone who has a GPA lower than most of the averages on the MSAR? I'm studying for the MCAT right now and haven't taken it yet. Yeah, so I'm an expert in um, working with students with low scores. So um, just so you know, last application cycle, the lowest MCAT score I got someone accepted with was a 498 to a DO school and a 503 to an MD. And in terms of GPA, the lowest um, science GPA was a 2.7 to an MD and a 2.84 to a DO for science. And for cumulative, um, a 3.0 cumulative to an MD and a 3.28 to um, a DO school. So it is possible? It is definitely possible. It's right. about right, submitting absolutely gorgeous essays and materials um, as early as possible, right, and having a, a solid strategy in place um, and being very careful with your school selection. Okay. Sometimes it might require a post back program, but that's not what we're, what we're talking about now, right? As long as you have an increasing trend um, and you have – strong activities, um, right, if you have a lot to say, um, if you worked multiple jobs, putting yourself through college, um, you know, whatever the situation is, it is possible to get accepted with a low score as long as you're strong in other parts of the application and as long as you have an inc increasing trends in either your MCAT scores and or your GPA. Now, I'm posting, if you are interested in working with Alicia, I'm also posting her uh, contact page in the chat window now. It should, you should all have it, okay? Um, let's see what else we have here. 
If you're getting letters during your, from, I guess, from your school's committee process, should you get more letters once you begin your actual application? I'm not sure I understand the question. If you're getting letters during your school's committee process, should you get more letters once you begin? Your I think the person's application? asking about their committee letter service, yeah. Linda. Yeah. Yeah. So usually um, the committee letters are um, written earlier, right? They usually have interviews or it's a process um, to submit your application materials to them to get that letter first right? Um, and my advice would be to review actually the blog that I've written on pre-health committee letters, because most medical schools do not require them. So every year, less and less schools um, require them. And I can actually um, give you the link, Linda, to post um, to oh, that sure. blog. Or I, I can, so, uh, I'm actually looking for it now. Yeah, committee letters. Um, yeah. If you can find it. Um, sure. But yeah, it's very few schools. So the title of it is actually Which Allopathic U.S. Medical Schools Require Committee Letters? Um, and this was published last year and it was only 12. The year prior to that, in 2018, it was 14, right? So every year I've seen that number slowly inching um, down. So most programs, you know, do not like those committee letters. They're basically just quoting the other letters in the packet. It's about as useful as translating English to English, <laughs> right? So it's far more effective to just go and read the letter yourself, <laughs> right, directly than having some pre-health committee who doesn't really know you well quote those letters about you. So if you take a look at that blog, you'll see most medical schools do not require it. Um, you know, so you don't really need to have a pre-health committee letter unless you're interested in applying to those 12 schools. Okay. And we have a question I think that many people are dealing with here. This is from an anonymous attendee. How do you ask for clinical or community service letters, I assume, if many of those got canceled? Oh, uh, my heart goes out to you guys. I know these are unprecedented times, um, and it's so challenging. So I would say do your best. So with my clients, um, I'm trying to help them find alternative options. So looking at virtual um, scribing positions, shadowing, um, and I have recommendations in all of these areas for my clients. Um, so there are ways to do it. There are ways to be involved virtually, um, and some of them are quite creative and quite exciting. So it is possible to get clinical experience virtually. It's mm -hmm. tricky, right? You have to do a bit more research and, uh, and um sort of be willing um, and open to consider things you might not have um, before the pandemic, but it is definitely possible to get some valuable clinical experience and letters of rec um, from clinical activities virtually. Some, some options in terms of virtual clinical activities would be contact tracing. Another one mm -hmm. is um, call lines, you know, suicide helplines, depression helplines, those kinds of things. Yeah, crisis hotlines right, are exactly. a great way to go. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now, yeah. Matthew, <laughs> Matthew, that was the word I was looking for. Matthew has a very interesting <laughs> question here. Um, what patterns have you recognized among good primary and secondary writers, if any? That's a really good question. Um, honestly, there shouldn't be patterns in common if we're talking about different individuals, right? Well, Every person think, should have their angle. Every person should have those um, things that they're highlighting in their background that are unique to them. That is the common thread. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but really, I mean, I, I would be horrified if any of my clients' secondaries ever sounded similar, right? right. I want each person to, um, their personality to come out, for their reasons to be honest and genuine and unique to them. Um, and for them to do their own research about the schools, right, to be thinking. And the earlier you start that process of figuring out what's different um, from school to school, like this is a great time to be doing that when there's no pressure, you know, taking notes, you know, going on those virtual tours, participating in virtual events, um, and just taking notes about what you're noticing is different about each school. That would be the best use of your time early, is taking the time to figure out what's different from school to school, what can I comment on, um, that will demonstrate how much research I've done, that um, will also um, provide insight on how right, your goals align with the school's mission and goals. Right. 
So, I mean, I guess that's another pattern is taking the time to um, make it clear that you've done your research about the school. In terms of, of writing patterns, I think, I think um, as Alicia said, reflecting yourself as an individual is, yep. is key. Okay, that is the, the way to do it. Now, what are some techniques for doing that? One is to combine anecdote and analysis. The anecdotes of stories from your life will automatically be unique to you. And your interpretation of those events, your perspective on those events, as long as you, know, you don't take the top layer of the onion, will also be unique and distinctive to you and, will, and should all be aimed for the primary at showing your fitness to become a physician and for the secondary at showing your fit with that particular school's mission and values. I would say that's the, those are in my mind, the, the patterns and it fits very much with what Alicia just said of successful primary and secondary applications. But then it has to depend on the, it depends on the question, right? Oh, like absolutely. Like you don't want to provide an anecdote. If oh, it's, absolutely. Um, yeah, like why are- good point. Really <laughs> yeah. good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. It yeah. has to, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, let's see what else we have here. But thank you for the question. Um, so another anonymous attendee, again, I don't know if it's the same one or a different one, asks, is it okay to replace a community service and clinical letters of recommendation with a second non-science professor if the non-science professor knows you better? Is quality or variety more important? Many of my community service and clinical opportunities got canceled. So I feel like they don't interact with me as much as non-science professors. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's, this is, these are challenging times. Um, you want to ask the person who knows you best. That being said, it, to make sure that you meet the requirements for different schools, having a clinical letter or a, a community service letter is really going to make, you know, help you make sure that you meet all the requirements. If you only have two science professor letters and one non-science professor letter, you could get into trouble if a, if a school requires a community service letter, for example. Um, so you want to be flexible. So you want to have the flexibility to provide any combination that the school is asking for. Okay. Another, another couple of questions on the letters, which apparently is a real pain point this year. If your undergrad schools send a composite letter for you, you still have to follow the letter number requirements. You know, the, how many letters per yeah, category? Yeah, that's different. That if it's a packet, yeah, then that's different. Um, so if you're using a letter packet, um, not so much. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so thank you for that question. And then, if any you have any other questions, please feel free to post them. Is it okay to reach out to supervisors of, or of clinical and community service opportunities for letters of recommendation I did in the last two years, i.e. before COVID, but could not continue this year due to COVID? How do I reach yeah. out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, you know, emailing, calling, you know, usually trying multiple methods, contact methods until you get a response. Um, or if you have to track them down, for example, if the organization no longer exists or um, if for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're no longer operating um, or they've taken a break, um, if they're furloughed, for example, then you could just um, try to find if there's an alternate method of contacting them. You might have to call the organization and see if you can somehow get in touch with those people. Or it's always a good idea, and this is a really great question, it's always a good idea to maintain personal contact with important supervisors. Right, like if you know you're going to be applying for jobs or you know you're going to be applying to medical school, it's a really good idea to maintain regular contact with your mentors and with anybody you know who is planning on writing you a letter of rec or anybody you're planning on asking for a letter of rec. You're just up checking in with them, updating them on how you're doing, asking how they're doing. Just maintaining those relationships in general is a really smart strategy. Right. And probably better to start with um, asking about them as opposed to, uh, you know, going straight, straight to how they can help you. Yeah, right. It's asking how they're doing, checking in with them, maintaining those relationships. Because you'll end up with better letters, right? Right. Now, 
I'm right now posting, many of you are going to, this is kind of related to what we've been discussing in terms of the fact that, you know, uh, many volunteer opportunities or clinical opportunities to be sure were, were canceled because of COVID. You're also going to have to ask questions in all likelihood about how you responded to the pandemic. So um, I'm posting a couple of resources that I developed in terms of how to address COVID-19 and the events of 2020 in your application. One is a podcast episode, one is a short video, so you can use those if you want. Um, and again, we have somebody requesting that uh, you, you, you uh, repeat one, one more time the documents to give your recommenders. Oh, yeah, and I think you actually copied them. Um, oh, oh, the documents to give your recommenders is a right, letter packet. Right, right. Yep, let me just pull that up. Okay. Okay, so for the packet that you're going to give each letter writer, I would, you know, give them a deadline. I would give them a final draft of your personal statement, an updated copy of your resume or CV, generate, you know, a cover letter from Interfolio or the AMC letter service with a barcode to provide to them. It gives them instructions on how to upload the letter. And then any other necessary materials or any materials they ask for, like a copy of your transcript. And another thing, a really, really good idea would be to create a separate page, just one page, and I often do this with clients, and just create a list of bullet points since you last worked with the person or saw the person or took their class, a list of bullet points of things you've done, highlights since then. Maybe you ran a marathon. Maybe you started an organization. Maybe you got you know, an article published. Um, have just a list of highlights since you last saw or worked with that person. And then that helps give them easy points to add to their letter of rec. Okay. And another question from Matthew. Matthew, you're hitting the jackpot with these questions. I get mixed input on community college prereqs. What type of applicant can afford to take some prereqs at a community college? And what type of applicant should stick to taking the rest of their prerequisites at a four-year institution? So in my experience, um, if you are trying to get into Ivy League, obviously, right, you don't want to um, take courses at a community college. If you're already in, at a four-year school or, you know, if there's no reason for you to be taking classes at a community college, you know, it just looks like you might be trying to take an easier version um, of the course. Um, if you attend community college directly from high school because that's all that you could afford, that was all that was available to you, um, that's never going to hurt you, right? So medical schools can't discriminate. Um, if that's what you could afford to do and that was the best option for you, but they can't discriminate against you for that. Is there anything you want to add to that, Linda? Not really. I mean, yeah. my, my impression is that certainly the higher ranked medical schools, if not many medical schools, prefer that the prerequisites are taken at a, at a four-year institution. Yeah. Um, so, but, yeah, like the top tier um, schools, yeah. Right, right. Um, but we've definitely had plenty of applicants get accepted who start out at community college and, and transfer. Yep, I would agree, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so at this point, um, I'd like to close with a story a thought and a question, a little, uh, a favor really of, of you folks. First, I want to thank Alicia for her excellent presentation. Um, and I want to thank you listeners, uh, webinar attendees for your time, your attention, your questions and your answers. Now the story, an applicant came to us a few years ago. He was struggling in multiple ways with the application process, not the least of which was a below 3.0 undergraduate GPA. He sought Alicia's advice in December before MCAS opened and worked with her steadily through the application process. Today, he is a medical school student who earned roughly a 50% scholarship for the full four years of medical school. Now, that's a story with a happy ending, a real happy ending. I'd like your medical school application story to have a similar ending. To increase the likelihood of that, realize that the med school application process is a marathon, not a sprint. 
and the course goes through a complex maze of primary applications, secondary applications, letters of recommendation, and interviews. Give yourself the gift of an experienced coach through this process. The med medical students you've heard from had that personal coach and mentor. Follow in their footsteps. Get accepted. And now, well, I see there's a question here. If we choose to work with accepted for our med school application, how do we get paired with a mentor? Do we pick the mentor or are we randomly assigned? Um, it's not a random assignment. You can request to work with a specific consultant if you prefer, uh, or you can rely on us to choose the best consultant for you that, you know, that, we, that we feel we have based on the information we have about you. And now I, I said I have a question. Thank you for that question also. Um, you're very welcome. Um, I mentioned also that Alicia is currently available. She will book up. If you want to work with her, you can definitely request her and work with her. So what's my question to you? Okay, my question to you is as follows. We really appreciate your time and your attention. You stayed for this webinar. You stayed for the pitch, the Q&A, and you stayed for my little close. You certainly seem to be interested in what Alicia and I have to say. And I really appreciate some, some insight. I'm very curious if, if, and I'm hoping you can help me out with this question. If you're not already a client or planning to become a client of Accepted, would you be willing to share your reasons for not engaging one-on-one -on -one with Accepted? Question. And you can, I don't care if you put that in the chat or the question window, I'll, I'll, I can handle it. Anybody want to help me out with that? I'd really appreciate it. Very expensive for my family. Yeah. Okay. Um, it is an expense. So is medical school. Uh, but it might be more expensive for your family if you don't use accepted and you don't get accepted services or assistance with your application. That was a point I was making earlier. We also do have a firm, which was just added to our website this, this past week. And that means that you can pay back the expense of accepted services over time. And I also want to point out that our clients last year got almost $2 million worth of scholarships, much like the client I mentioned a minute ago that can, again, really add to the ROI of working with accepted. But, you know, when you have former admissions uh, committee directors and members, as well as um, highly experienced consultants, obviously they, I need to, to pay them appropriately. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Emily wrote that she's considering a different service since they have admissions committee members from top 10 med schools. Um, we have, do have com admissions committee members on staff. Most of our consultants either have decades of consulting experience or have um, admissions committee experience. If you look at the list of accepted medical schools or schools where our clients have been accepted, you'll see that they were accepted at top programs. Uh, I know one client right now is, I think, nine interviews at top medical schools. Uh, he worked with uh, Dr. Herman Gordon. And, um, you know, obviously you have to choose the consultancy that you feel is going to work best for you. But you may want to look at our 26-year track record. I don't think there's a medical school. That, I don't think there are any other admission, med school admissions consultancies, including the one that you're looking at, that have that kind of track record. Now, Jolson wrote, I would love to work with Accepted. I would just like to speak with someone first before committing just for added comfort, but you guys sound amazing. Thank you. Um, you can, um, you definitely can speak with somebody. We do offer free consultations to those people considering our service. And you have a week to take advantage of the special that um, we have for you, right? It's on the screen now. And so I would just suggest that you go to accept.com slash primary and you'll see the options there for speaking with a consultant before you buy or for the free med consultation. And I po posted earlier Accepted's, um, Alicia's contact page. If you specifically want to work with her, you can request that in the forms that you'll be asked to fill out on accept.com primary 
or on the contact when if you go to the Alicia's contact page, you don't have to request anything. It'll it'll definitely you'll definitely work with Alicia. Be referred to Alicia. Okay. And let's see. Any other? Okay, Matthew asks, this is a really interesting question. Alicia, how would you answer this one? And first of all, do you have any anything to add to my responses to the earlier questions? No, no, not not yet. Well, if you do interrupt me, stop me. Okay, I so will. This, is, this is a question from Matthew. I have my ideas, but to you, what is the most important service an applicant can order a la carte? Oh, that's a difficult question because um, I work with people maybe on just, you know, one section and they go and do something that hurts their application in the other areas. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I don't think there's any Matthew, one are section. You a, a reapplicant or a first time applicant? Twenty twenty two applicant, I think is a first time applicant. Go ahead. I'm okay. sorry. I didn't yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I've helped people with the primary application and they try to do secondaries on their own, um, but maybe they, they do something um, that hurts their application in the secondaries and they don't get end up getting interviews, and I've worked with those people as reapplicants. Um, or, you know, they start doing their own secondaries and they're not getting interviews, so then they work with me on the ones they have remaining and then they end up getting interviews for those, you know, secondaries that they worked with me on. Um, I've had, this was the most heartbreaking situation, and you probably remember this, Linda. I helped someone apply to vet school. She got um, an interview at one of the top vet schools in the country. We did the primary, the secondaries together, and um, she did not tell me she got an interview. She went and did it on her own, and then I got an email saying that it didn't go well um, from her and that she would be reapplying. Um, so that was crushing to work with someone so closely through the first part of the application and then um, for her to struggle with the interview and ultimately not get an acceptance. Um, so really, I think each part of the process is, is important in a different way. Um, and I have the highest success rates with people who work with me every step of the process. Right. If, if I were to answer your question, Matthew, it, it is, I mean, we have the comprehensive services and we believe in those services. Um, if you were to come a la carte, I think it depends a little bit on where you feel your weakest. If you feel that you don't, you know, like you don't have a strategy, you don't know where to apply, you don't know what you should be doing now, then maybe the most important thing for you is to get an hour or two of advising just to get yourself on the right, right foot and have some direction. You can obviously come back later, but at least you have a foundation that that will allow you to move forward. If you have direction and you and you're very confident you're applying to the appropriate school, because I think that's that's foundational. Then and you maybe you don't lack you lack confidence in your writing ability, your ability to tell a story, um, then maybe it's it's the essay writing that you really need help with. The essays, the most meaningful experiences, the activity descriptions, and yes, the secondaries. Or maybe you're nervous and shy. And then mock interviews probably would be maybe a little tongue-tied. Then mock interviews would probably be the best uh, a la carte service for you. Anyway, I've an I hope I've answered that question. Um, okay, just admissions consulting, that's fine. That's fine. We'd be delighted to work with you. Um, any any more responses to my question? But you've been extremely helpful. I really appreciate the insight that you've shared. And I hope my responses have, have helped you also. And with that, I'm going to thank you again for your time, your attention, your questions, your answers to my question. I want to thank Alicia. And I want to wish you all just much success with your medical school applications. I also want to wish you... Uh, happy holiday and a happy, healthy new year, hopefully one in which COVID becomes history. Take care, everybody. <laughs>